Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn. Focus Compounding Podcast, the number one value investing podcast in the world, on air with my co-founder, Mr. Jeffrey Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How is it going with you? It is going great. Today is March 31st, end of Q1 of 2020. What a crazy quarter it was. One for the record books, for sure. In today's podcast, uh, we are going to be going over uh, stocks that you have written up on Focus Compounding. And every single time that you do write up a stock, you usually add a revisit price. And given all the volatility in the market and the sell-off, a lot of those companies are close to your revisit price. So I figured, why not spend some time on this podcast, really just to go through a lot of those companies and see if there's any sort of updated thoughts, you know, see where they're trading and see if there's anything that, you know, we could sort of get out of it to make it as actionable as possible. Obviously, a lot of people are bargain hunting now. Uh, so I think it'll be a good time to do that. If this is the first time that you're tuning in with Jeff and myself and you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. And of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, a rating and review goes a very long way and is greatly appreciative. All right, so in today's podcast, the first company that we are going to be going over is Garrett Motion. Ticker is GTX. This is a company that Jeff wrote up um, a while ago. Um, and let's see, you have a revisit price of the stock at $7 per share, and it's at two ninety nine now. So okay. you were, and if you look at the, I mean, this just talks, I mean, the PE now, of course, you know, that's last year's earnings is, uh, looks like if we want to round up and be nice, it's about one times earnings. 52 week low is $2 and 50 cents and 52 week high is $19 and 71 cents. Um, and again, your revisit price was $7. Um, so I have quick FS pulled up. Jeff, can you see quick FS good? I can. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so so that means they you, can see it. If you look at the actual write up, I'm not the biggest fan of Garrett Motion for a couple reasons. So one, it's just not in my circle of competence. So Garrett Motion has a strong market position. They make turbochargers um, for uh, cars. So I think they say light vehicle, gasoline, and diesel. I think diesel is important. Um, and I don't know anything about diesel. I know very little about cars. I know less about cars in Europe than in the US. Uh, and so it was just outside my circle of competence. In addition to that, the company is one of a series of spinoffs that I didn't like that much. If you remember, I talked about spinoffs and how I kind of wasn't a big fan of a lot of the spinoffs we were seeing, whether it was Residio Technologies or Garrett Motion. Those are both spinoffs from the same uh, uh, company there. Um, and uh, from everything from the debt position that they were leaving them with to other things like that. So... It was not something I was um, that excited about. However, I did put a revisit price on it. Now, it's worth mentioning my revisit price was what? Half or Your less revisit the price was, yeah, yeah it, it was $7. Um, so, yeah, it was a little bit less than half of the of the 52-week high. Yeah. So, it was probably a, a oh, much I'm sorry, a little more. Yeah, a little more. My bad. Yep. Okay. Um, so, it's not a stock that I would ever consider personally. But we can look at it and, and see what we think about it. Um, so the company is a spinoff. It has uh, exposure, cyclical exposure. Um, it's uh, basically like uh, an auto parts supplier. But once it provides something to the, the company for that model or whatever, I doubt they would lose the business. So they probably know how much they're going to sell or I shouldn't say that how much they'll have relative to what the output of that model and for that um, company will be. So it will depend on the total number of cars that are actually sold, but they probably do know things like, okay, well, if we're being used in this, um, if we're being used in the, you know, um, Volkswagen Beetle or whatever, then it just depends on how many Beetles are sold or whatever. Now that's not the car that it would be, but you get the idea. So mm -hmm. um, the problem often for suppliers in this situation is that they may be paid uh, in terms of how many cars are sold. And so they priced it based on the idea that say that customer will sell 3 million cars and they'll really sell 1 million or something, which happens in like a recession. And if that happens and they make a lot less money, we saw it in like 2008. Now to be fair to some of these auto parts companies, what they do is immediately they renegotiate the contract when it comes up so that 
they price it at a much higher price per vehicle afterwards and they restore the gross profit. But that does happen a lot with them. So with, with uh, auto parts suppliers. So it's potentially very dangerous to auto parts suppliers, a downturn in um, auto. And obviously a lot of their customers have already shut down production. And I mean, we own a car dealer and car dealers have warned, you know, that basically they don't need more cars. <laughs> so there's not a big need to start up production again and supply them with more cars because so far people aren't coming to car dealerships. So there'll be a backlog there. So it'll be a really steep drop. This is one of those things where we talked about, like how this will be steeper than in 2008, 2009. Um, it may be a fast recovery, but that's the problem. And then I just don't, I've always seen some like, credit issues and stuff with this company as compared to other ones. Um, it's just one of the spinoffs that I wasn't uh, that excited by. So it might be a really good um, recovery possibility, but it's not a business that I understand well enough. So, um, and it is definitely affected by uh, coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so, and for people that may not know, a lot of times when Jeff writes up a stock on the website, he's not necessarily recommending people go out and buy it. And I think a lot of people actually value those write-ups more, Jeff, when you, you know, say, eh, I'm not interested in it. Here's why. Uh, but I'll definitely revisit it at this price in the future. And to your point earlier, like you said, you know, you didn't, you didn't like this company from the beginning. And we've said, you know, for the past, I don't know, year that there's a lot of spinoffs or all the recent spinoffs anyways, just haven't been that attractive. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, fell on that boat. Uh, next company, we are going to go over CPHC Canterbury Park Holdings. Um, you, let's see, wanted to potentially revisit, revisit it around $9 uh, per share. Mm -hmm. And it is trading $9.53. Um, uh, let's see, they own, what do they own? They own a casino, uh, they do own a, uh, own a horse racing track, um, and stuff like that. Where's, where's this one at? Minnesota, right? Yeah. Minnesota. And yeah. it is currently trading 10 times, you know, last year's earnings. Um, but you know, this is a company that we've spoken about a few different times, you and I, uh, mm -hmm. do you have any update thoughts on the business? I know they shut down the casino. I don't know if it's still shut down. Yeah, they shut it down. So um, this is a company that was a horse track and a pretty, to my looking at it, a pretty updated and, and well kept up horse racing track. It's only a few miles away from a um, uh, American Indian casino, and they have some sort of deal with them, which we can get into in a second, um, to protect the, the basically the lobby against certain gambling expansions in the state and stuff. Um, it is only a card room, so it's a card casino. So it's an on-banked uh, card casino. So uh, maybe a third or something of it is poker. Other things are forms of blackjack and other table games like that. Uh, and it's not banked by the casino. So players are playing against each other. Um, the company owns a lot of land, which is potentially valuable and which they are in the middle of redeveloping, which is the problem here. So there's all sorts of problems caused by the fact that they've shut down while also trying to develop an area. And so there's serious like credit issues and stuff here. Not that they won't get over them, but it changes this a lot. I'm surprised the stock hasn't declined a lot more than it has um, just because of the risks involved with doing this right now. So they were hoping to redo all sorts of things, including stuff that would give them interest in apartment buildings that were going to be built to long-term stay hotel stuff to just everything. Um, we could just, I mean, you can go on their website and look at their investor presentation on it, and we'll just give you details about all the things that they're planning in the different stages of this. I think that it's very possible that that development um, could be worth a very large portion of the stock price. And then on top of that, your, uh, your card casino. And I think potentially that could increase its earnings too. So I think it's uh, sort of a sum of the parts thing, but it's very attractive. However, it is what it's doing now is really risky in terms of the amount of debt and stuff it'll take on to do this. And if projects don't get sold and if whatever happens, it, it potentially could go badly. For instance, they did some stuff where they raised money, which depends on these um, bonds, which depends on the increase of the tax income from the area and stuff. Obviously that's now in, in danger. Um, the place is shut down so it can burn cash and things like that. The other issue that is a, bigger one in normal times for me is that this company is collecting quite a lot of money from uh, a deal that it has with an American Indian tribe, which runs the 
uh, casino nearby. And they call it a co-marketing deal. I would say it's more of like a lobbying agreement. So they collect several million dollars, which goes mostly to enhance purses at the racetrack. And enhanced purses at the racetrack attracts um, more gambling because it attracts both better horses and bigger fields. So you don't gamblers don't want to bet on a race of like four horses. They'd rather bet on one with like nine horses. So you want a larger average field. And then you also want to have better horses, which attracts um, more uh, gambling. And remember that some of this gambling that we're talking about is off track in the sense that it's at other um, horse racing tracks and stuff. So also they collect money that way. People bet on things that are simulcast in other places and things they can take bets for other racetracks around the country, which are also closed, obviously. So uh, that's a problem. The racetrack itself, I think, doesn't really make money and I don't expect it to, but losing that um, payment would be a big deal. I don't know that they will lose that payment. They've had it for many years. It doesn't come up for a few more years. And if they were to lose it, um, they might then lobby to be allowed to expand the gambling operations in their own uh, location because that's sort of what the deal is. The deal seems to be that the they and this American Indian tribe will both lobby to not expand gambling in other places in Minnesota. And also Canterbury Park will not um, try to expand the kind of gaming that goes on at their site. So it'll be limited to this card room, basically. Um, I say card room. It's a pretty big card room. But um, that's the risk that I see longer term. I am really surprised the stock hasn't declined more. But it is potentially when I looked at it and stuff, it could be worth double what you see now. I mean, there are ways that you can calculate it where you could easily come up with a price that's worth $20 a share or something, but it depends on this redeveloping stuff uh, in the area. So it's kind of partially the development stuff and partially the casino stuff. Um, I like the stock a lot more than Garrett Motion, and I'm much more interested in this one. What is it about casinos that you like in even normal times? I mean, do you think casinos are more like recession proof than most businesses because you're kind of capitalizing on, I guess, people being degenerates or, or addicted? I mean, like, what are your thoughts on like just casinos in general? I don't like casinos like, in so general. Both in, both in, both in like normal times and then in, let's say, a recession. Yeah, I don't like casinos. Because the I would like them if you had a guaranteed um, monopoly on a certain area. But as we're going to see when I think we talk about Monarch Cement, the problem is that a casino is not a natural monopoly. A casino is just a monopoly created in an area by government uh, order. They allow gambling at that place and not at others. And the history of countless countries, including the United States, is to keep expanding that over and over again to further and further. I mean, this was a racetrack, and then they expanded it into a card uh, casino. Um that's constantly happening in places. And of course, if you have problems related to recessions and things, every time that happens, every time the state's finances have issues, they expand it even more. So I would love casinos if I thought that they were a monopoly that would stay in place. But I just think that over time, their their moat will always shrink because it, gambling only expands um, in, in states. It doesn't, it doesn't decline. So I would expect that to be a, a problem. And so I generally don't like casinos. Mm-hmm. What about Game Host? Uh, Game Host is a stock that was run up on Focus Compounding, and you said that you would be interested in revisiting it at four dollars and forty cents, and it's currently trading at three dollars and ninety four cents. Um, if I remember correctly, they're also a casino in Canada. Yes. So mm -hmm. we're you know sticking with the same topic. Uh, is there any new update or any thoughts on Game Host? Well, from the thing I was talking about about Monopoly stuff, this one's a lot safer. As one casino in Calgary that I don't know about um I, they claim that's pretty far away from other casinos in the city but there's plenty of places to gamble so i don't know about that however it has them in a couple other locations it also owns some hotels but i think the purpose of the hotels is just to provide a captive audience um to the casinos these casinos are less well kept up than um canterbury park i think that they're um not putting enough capex and stuff into them and so I think that they're very just dependent on uh, their local monopoly that they have. However, they're in a couple cities that are sort of um, almost micropolitan areas instead of uh, metropolitan areas. They are real cities of size, but they don't have much around them. And uh, they're probably negatively affected if like things like oil prices and stuff decline. There's other industries besides oil in the area. But I mean, I think 
top industries might be oil, timber, tourism, things like that. It's not a very diversified economy in these locations. So I do think they have a really big advantage in that I don't think that other casinos will show up in those areas, both because I think they actually have the capacity to serve the entire community, just at the casinos they have. These aren't that big areas. And I also think the regulator that they have is very not interested in increasing licenses. As far as I know, there's been no new license issued since the financial crisis uh, in like the Alberta region. So that's a um, so as compared to like Minnesota or something, I think it's safer that they won't expand stuff here. I don't like management as much here and some things like that, but I do. Th- and uh, obviously it, things could get worse in these areas um, that depend on stuff like oil and things like that. So, uh, but I do like the, and I just like the locations. I mean, I think they're better protected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when we were reading like, um, you know, Google and stuff like that, the reviews of the casinos, they weren't necessarily positive at all. I remember like to your point, a lot of people, I believe of game hosts were saying that it was, they were more run down and um, it's not like they were like five stars. And uh, I do remember that it's tied to the the oil industry in in that area, mm-hmm. which I remember had you know a boom and bust or whatever, and a lot of people were concerned about that with the stock. Next company, MCEM, a company that we talk about often, Monarch Cement. This is a business that you like at a certain yeah. price. Um, your revisit price for the stock was fifty dollars, and we're a little bit under it, forty eight twenty five. Yeah, so Monarch Cement, why I like a cement company better than a casino is its returns are much poorer than a casino, but it's a natural monopoly. So it's not a government regulation or something. It's that uh, the economies of scale at a cement plant are very, very large. And then on top of that, you have a very low uh, value to weight ratio. So because you have a low value to weight ratio in shipping the product, you won't ship it very far generally. And if you ship into other areas and stuff, you'll do it by barge and stuff like that. So um, you end up with a industry where the different cement plants know that if you draw a circle around a cement plant, you know who should win bids for different things in there. So generally, if you are a less, um, a less, a less of the low cost producer and further away, you know that you shouldn't be bidding for stuff in someone else's territory effectively. Um, that just should be very obvious. So it's a much more attractive business because it's something that it's been around a hundred years um, and is likely to be around another hundred years and doesn't need government intervention or something to give them a monopoly. They will naturally have one. So I like it a lot. Returns on equity are not high. Um, uh-huh. uh, returns on equity are not high because uh, cement is very capital intensive. So, and this particular company does not, as opposed to bigger companies in the industry, like to use debt. They use debt occasionally to expand capacity and that's it. You can see it's very cyclical. So you saw that like, uh, by the way, this data only shows you to 2016 because this company stopped filing with the SEC, but its website has completely up-to-date information. It puts out annual reports and stuff. It's not a dark stock. It just doesn't file with the SEC anymore. But using the data we have here from 2007 to 2016, you can see the decline in like operating profit, right? And then the rebound in it cyclically that matches up with the uh, recession. So it's a very cyclical stock that way. I think normally uh, the plant could easily earn 8 to 12% returns on equity. I know I'm very certain that the plant is, if you do like um, the capacity, so the number of tons that it could be producing, and it has been producing close to capacity lately, um, versus the enterprise value, it's very, very cheap. So I'm sure that there have been offers to buy the company that have been refused. Uh, probably about half of the company is owned by something like five families that are involved in sort of refounding it when it needed the capital put into it and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I was going to read you a tweet. I was going to read you a tweet that Trump uh, tweeted today. It says, with interest rates for the United States being at zero, this is the time to do our decades-long awaited infrastructure bill. It should be very big and bold. $2 trillion and be focused solely on jobs and rebuilding the once great infrastructure of our country, phase four. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, you know, I want to talk about Monarch Cement because, I mean, depending on what they do, I mean, a lot of times you would think, okay, if we do hit a recession, companies like Monarch Cement may be hit by that. Um, But, you know, if they have this massive infrastructure plan, and, you know, obviously that would bode well for Monarch Cement. I think it'd be, you know, interesting uh, to, uh, you know, learn more about it. 
Yeah. Assuming and, that they directly are affected by it or benefit from it. I mean, who knows? I mean, in the middle of, you know, Kansas or wherever they are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they are in the middle of Kansas. Um, so I, I think that they would benefit from it, but you also have to remember that in a recession, some of the other uses of cement decline a lot. Uh, but yeah, just plenty of cement goes into public work stuff. Plenty of cement also goes into stuff like building, um, uh, commercial industrial type things and stuff too, which would decline a lot. Some of it goes into residential less so, but, um, yeah, it's a pretty mixed group of it. So it just depends on the amount of construction that you would need for things there. And yeah, the, the company is in Kansas. It serves an area around there. It's not affected by things outside of it. It's not affected by imports and exports. I don't want to get into a whole thing about it. We did a podcast on it, but because it's in the center of the country, I think it's a much better asset than if it was on the coast. Like the cement plant I'd least like to own is something in like the Los Angeles area or something because it's very sensitive to imports from Asia and stuff. There's, it's very hard for imports to affect you if you're in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think it's, it's a lot more attractive that way. I think the least attractive ones are sort of places where there's major ports and things like that. So um, I, I like it overall. It's very conservative. I don't know if you know what the dividend is on it. You could probably find the dividend. But I mentioned this because the company is very uh, religious about their dividend. So it's, let's see, dividend yield is four for 4%. Four percent. Yeah. So, so you know, very, that's, yeah. A much, that's a much firmer dividend than what you'll see on big stocks. I'm not promising you'll get that dividend, but on big cap stocks and things, there's plenty of companies that might cut it. Monarch Cement doesn't like to do that. They're, they believe that the families and stuff rely on it and don't really think of it as like a public company. They think of it as just a dividend check that you get. And so, I mean, I, I did a thing where I talked about like the 40 year history that they had and everything and what they did with whether it's their dividend or whatever. The other thing is the company might buy back stock below book value. So I think they see buying back stock at book value as just a way of getting people out who want to get out and they'll just do that. So I would expect the company is willing to buy people out below book value as long um, they don't buy ever seem to buy the stock above book value. And then the other thing is that they will uh, pay that dividend out. Remember the stuff you're seeing on quick RFS is incorrect because mm. it's not updated to today. So they're actually probably, they're actually probably below book value right now. And um, although I don't know because they have a stock portfolio, so that's a little complicated. They have a stock portfolio, which has probably declined a lot, but Anyway, of the companies we talked about so far, this one would be one I would like a lot. I don't see tremendous upside for it, but I think that dividend is pretty safe, and I think they're willing to buy back stock below book value. Uh huh. F. W. Thorpe. Uh, this is a company that you wrote about um, more so recently, I believe, mm -hmm. and you said that you would want to revisit it at two or two hundred fifty dollars per share, and it's currently trading at two hundred forty nine dollars per share. Um, I think I'll have to pull up a different. Um, let's see. Probably sure they may have home. it. Yeah, they may. Let's see if they have it on here, which I'm not sure if they. Oh, maybe they do. Maybe it's updated. 2019. Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah, they have it. Yep. And this was, yeah, a stock that um, they do lighting and commercial lighting and LEDs and stuff like that. Yeah, they do all sorts of things. They have businesses that even do lighting for uh, street lights, um, for, you know, uh, bridges, tunnels, highways, uh, street lights. Um, they do signs like you would put outside a bar, things like that. They do the lighting that you have in warehouses. They do all sorts of lighting. Uh, they, they have stuff that goes into, you know, like clean rooms and stuff. So they're very diversified. I like the organization a lot. The stock is very expensive and I don't see a big future for a lot of growth in led lighting. I think that led is kind of peaked. And I mean, I know it from reading annual reports of all the businesses that they serve. They like to talk all the time about the sustainability stuff and all of that. Um, the company's going to try their best to convince companies that it's about um, saving money and not about just going green. They had a big boost from the company just wanting to go green. And if they'd also saved the money, that was great. But it was probably too much of that and not enough focused on long term how they could save money on things. Um, they've added a lot of stuff to try to make the lights smarter. So that it can also monitor things like um, people moving around and temperatures and all sorts of other things by putting sensors and lights in places, which would be helpful for places like um, warehouses and stuff like that. But just generally things where there's a small number of people moving around sometimes at certain parts of the day. Um, so they're doing all sorts of things like that. I really like the organization, like the company. It's an incredibly expensive stock compared to its future and relative to other opportunities in the market. So it doesn't interest me at all. 
does not interest you at all. Let's talk about AGM. This was a Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation. We talked a little bit about it uh, at the beginning of the podcast. And, or actually we talked about before we recorded, I think, uh, this is the company that <laughs> sometimes we do that. A lot of times when Jeff and I get on the mic together, I'm like, wait, don't let's stop talking. Let's just start recording and do this live. Um, uh, so do you want to talk about AGM? Sure. So trading AG- six times earnings. I'm sorry. And you said that you'd be interested in potentially revisiting it around $67 per share. And is that $54 and 50 cents per share? Yeah, so uh, this is Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation, better known as Farmer Mac. Um, it is, so as they say in this write-up, it was technically founded in the 1980s. However, it's a component of the farm credit system, basically, which is actually the first ever that I'm aware of government-sponsored enterprise in the United States. Um, so it, the system that it serves predates the um fanny and freddie so that was the original purpose of it and it, there were, had been a problem with credit and stuff oh over 100 years ago about 100 years ago um and so they started the farm credit system and then after that in the 80s they added um farmer mac to it so because there have been things happening with farms again so there have been two kind of booms and busts in farming that wiped out a lot of credit and stuff like that twice in the um, 1900s. So Farmer Mac was created. Farmer Mac is basically exactly the same as like Freddie Mac does the same thing. So um, it guarantees some stuff and then it also uh, buys some things. And what it buys is uh, farm and ranch mortgages and then also guarantees things in kind of two different ways. Um, some of the guarantees are basically guaranteeing against loss. Some of the guarantees are more used probably for like, um, capital reasons and stuff. Um, so what it's doing though, is taking all these risks that generally have to do just with farm and ranch mortgages. Occasionally the company has lost some money by expanding into some other things. A small number of the mortgages we're talking about are not really farm and ranch mortgages. They're probably for houses just in rural areas. They they have also bought loans to rural utilities and some things like that. Over time, their charter keeps getting expanded. Um, same as with other things in terms of what they're allowed to buy. And it's, you know, an incredibly leveraged company. It issues uh, bonds at some slight spread over U.S. Treasuries. And then it goes out and it buys uh, farm and ranch mortgages and does other things similar to uh, Freddie Mac, but mm-hmm. in the farm area, yeah. And I remember, and, go ahead. Yeah, so it it, um, it recently came out and said that it has been having some trouble uh, keeping the spreads as low as normal. So there's some uh, there there are some issues with their access to pub, to uh, credit markets, the same as everyone else. So it's just that the spreads have widened over um, U.S. Treasury. So normally you'd they'd issue something over U.S. Treasury. And it might be half a percent or one percent or whatever. And then now it's more than they were expecting. Um, and that's just because of what's been going on with coronavirus. Yeah, which would obviously pose a, a massive risk to the company, correct? I don't know. It's a very good question. I have no idea. And I don't know how we can figure that out. Uh, the stock. Um, so I don't know what will happen with farm and ranch mortgages as compared to other forms of credit. I would assume that they're some of the lowest risk. On the other hand, the company is very highly leveraged, but farm and ranch mortgages compared to everybody else do pretty well. So, I mean, we just getting into the math, they tend to have very high working, their borrowers tend to have very high working capital. Um, the loans also are only paid like twice a year, maybe. Um, depends on the loan, but something like twice a year is common. So they don't have to pay every month. So that doesn't cause the same problems that you would have with um, mortgages on houses and on commercial real estate. And they also tend to keep very, very large um, balances of cash on hand, of um, inventory, of all that stuff, as compared to other forms of borrowers that for mortgages. So like landlords aren't in a good position normally to be able to pay uh, if they're leasing out stuff to someone else and they miss a payment, 
they're collecting every month. They're running it on the expectation that they can pay every month. They don't keep large balances on hand to stay pretty liquid. Households are very illiquid. Um, farms are generally a lot more liquid. So I don't know. I mean, the farm stuff could be really badly hurt by this. And this company is incredibly leveraged, as we said before, the same as other GSEs. But as a form of loan, it does seem that if you are a bank or something, agricultural loans would be safer than other forms of lending at this time. So I don't know. It's very speculative in terms of me thinking about that and trying to figure that out. But agricultural borrowers should, I mean, there's still demand for food around the world. Um, there is, they do tend to have better balance sheets and not borrow as excessively um, as things like, you know, mall operators and office um, building owners and all those sorts of things. So I don't know. I mean, they're not, obviously farms and ranches aren't shut down. Um, rural utilities aren't shut down. So none of this stuff is directly shut down. So it's interesting. The stocks acted like other financial stocks though. So mm -hmm. yeah. It, anyway, so it, I don't know if I love the management and stuff here. And I believe their chief lending officer left recently I don't think that the company's management has generally been at the company for very long at most positions I would care about. A lot of them have had different positions in the farm credit system, though. Um, so it's one that, if it works out, will pay off very handsomely because this is a stock that has a uh, P of, like, what do we say, six or something? Yeah. Um, yeah. A and it can probably grow 10% a year while also paying its dividend. So it's as compared to things like um, Freddie Mac, though, it has a very, very small part of the uh, market. So it could easily quintuple in size to get to the same size as other GSEs and stuff in terms of its market share. So it has a very long runway to, for growth compared to those. So I don't know. It could be very risky, though, just like any financial thing right now. But I'm not clear on why. Um, agricultural loans would be riskier than other forms of lending. I would think less risky, but I don't know. Yeah, I remember when you wrote up your report for Focus Compounding, the CFO actually read it, and he said that that was the most comprehensive, longest write-up he's ever seen on the company. Um, and he really liked it. He didn't necessarily agree that uh, you qualified it as it, it not being an overlooked stock. He's like, actually, I think we are an overlooked stock. <laughs> and I had to, you know, obviously explain that what our definition of overlooked stock is. It's more, you know, black and white as opposed to, um, you know, being subjective. But no, he really liked it. And he said it was the longest report he's ever seen on the company. Yeah. So I should mention two things, though. One is they do need access to credit. Um, because that's how they fund themselves. So they don't have deposits or anything like banks, so they need that. And two, this is one of these implicit guarantees in which the general investing public believes that the U.S. government would not allow um, Farmer Mac debt to uh, go bad, right? So not the common stock, but that they would not allow people who buy these bonds uh, to not get paid on them. And, you know, banks and things buy these bonds. But I do want to point out that like the other GSEs, th their actual uh, credit line from the U.S. Treasury is very small compared to the size of their business. So um, this company was doing, uh, let's see, do we have information on this that I can see right here? No. Can you go to the balance sheet? Are you logged uh, in to go to the balance uh, sheet? Yeah. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. How do I let's see balance sheet? Okay. So if we look at the balance sheet, total assets at the end of 2019 were about $20 billion. If I remember right, and I could get this wrong, I think the credit line from the Treasury is a billion. But that's not uncommon. That was what, what the situation was with like Freddie Mac and stuff. The Treasury's actual line of credit that they offer them is very, very small. You can see there in the liabilities, though, look at the long-term debt, right? So that's very uh -huh. unusual. The funding is very different. And then they have also have commercial paper. And so it's extremely different from how most... Um, balance sheets would work that way, right? So it relies a lot on um, accessing public markets that have to be willing to buy a GSE's uh, debt. On the other hand, like I don't think the yield stuff should hurt them much at all, because as long as the yields on the securities they're buying um, are, ra are rising as high as the spread that they're having, like they're very interest rate neutral compared to most financial institutions. Because if I remember, I think that only about 0.2% of their earning assets uh, is 
is um, eaten up each year by their actual operating expenses other than interest. So, and just to put that in perspective, which I think I did, most banks pay more in rent than they pay on everything. So banks are much more sensitive to interest rates than uh, Farmer Mac is because Farmer Mac is just a matter of spread. And you can see that in their past results that all they care about is being, they can keep a much more stable net interest margin and uh, especially after their non-interest expenses. So there's all sorts of things about it that you would think would people would say, oh, we should own this instead of owning banks and stuff. So I'm kind of surprised by the reaction to it. But on the other hand, it's, it does rely 100% on accessing the market. So I guess mm-hmm. if you're very concerned about people not willing to uh, buy their bonds and stuff, then there is a problem. But other than market access, I don't know. It seems that it would have less risk than some, I mean, less be less affected than some financial institutions right now, I would think. But mm-hmm. that's not been the way the market's reacted. Sure. Would you have anything to say about psychomatics? Company, you said that you'd be interested sure. in potentially revisiting it around eight dollars per share. It's at five dollars and eighty cents. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, let's look at this. This is a company numbers. that Jeff wrote up on the website, uh, probably by the end of two thousand nineteen, and they do um, drug testing for yes. companies. And the stock originally sold off because they were going to lose their Brazil business, um, and then it looks like the stock has sold off more from that as well. Yes. So let's see. This is pretty easy to do. So the uh, free cash flow margin, let's see, has been 11% on the 10-year average. So if we just take, um, uh, let's see, revenue right now, let's say is $38 million last year. Let's chop off a third of that, assuming that's all Brazil business. That would take us down to $26 million. We assume that free cash flow is like one-tenth of that to just make this a round number. That's $2.6 million. So let's call that $2.5 million in what they could do in free cash flow in like a bad scenario. And their market cap is 32 million. So that looks cheap to me. So yeah, it looks cheap. Um, You're assuming, I mean, I just assumed, let's say that they lose a third of their business. Uh, Immediately they they will not, like the um, operating leverage will work badly for them, but they had plenty of years in the past. If you go back 10 years and stuff, they didn't have a Brazil business. So they had plenty of years in the past that they, Uh, earned a good return. And they have uh, that free cash flow number understates true free cash flow relative to revenue. They will do more than 11% of free cash flow uh, of sales turning into free cash flow because one, they used to pay higher taxes than they will now. And two, that free cash flow, I know for a fact that all the CapEx and stuff was to grow the Brazil business. This company has very cash uh, need to use up cash. So I don't know it'll grow a lot in the future. I have no idea what will happen with coronavirus stuff because of the drug testing thing. It means everyone will get fired. A lot of people will get fired. And then they'll be rehired back. And whether they'll rehire people and they'll do testing and stuff, I don't know. They have to do with filling applications normally. So it's not really the level of employment necessarily. It's how many new people are being hired and stuff. So in a sense, it's possible that they could have um, – that they wouldn't be as negatively affected as you'd expect, despite the fact that they're all in on labor. Um, so it, it pays everything out in a dividend. That's just the policy is that all of its excess cash paid out is at a dividend. You can see things like return on invested capital is excellent and all that. Um, the letters are pretty good. The shareholder letters that you get each year, they're pretty simple and understandable. No yeah. one owns a lot of the stock. I'm always surprised by that. So they pay out this big dividend, despite the fact that for a $32 million market cap stock, it has pretty low insider ownership. Uh, it, it's not one of these situations where it's you know family owned or something in a big way. So yeah, this is a very interesting stock. I don't think it's that tied to other sorts of things. And I think that it's probably cheap. It will have bad news though, because it will decline because of the loss of the Brazil business. But I think that's pretty factored in based on what I'm looking at here. So this is definitely one of the best that we've gone over but this is the best probably i mean farmer mac has the most upside because this won't grow that much i don't think over time but in terms of safety and stuff this is looking in the same category as monarch cement and maybe better interesting and i remember when you originally wrote about the company i mean you could argue that it was already factored in them losing the brazil business because they already announced that they were going to lose it and the stock sold off i think it was fairly valued based on them losing the brazil business when i looked at it yeah yeah yeah, I think it's so that's, it probably that could be cheap now. Yeah, cool. Uh, Jeff wanted to go over Carnival Corp, and you want to explain why Jeff they issued new yes. bonds today? Or yeah, so they, they announced they're doing three things. 
they're going to issue some common stock, they're going to issue some bonds, and they're going to issue some uh, convertible uh, bonds as well. Um, I did not seeing it know what the expected yield and stuff on it is going to be. I did see a headline. I think Bloomberg may have been the one that had the headline that they that they think it's going to be done at thirteen percent yield. Um, I don't know if that's true, but that's what was said. So if that's true, that's obviously a, a high yield there for a bond that's uh, due in a couple years. Um, there's also convertible and things like that. It's a private placement, but. Um, I just mentioned it because it's interesting that they're doing this. It's interesting that there might be opportunities in these things. I talked before about like whether Buffett would ever invest in something and things like that. And so you're starting to see possibilities for these distressed companies where there may be some things that people listening to this might have the opportunity to invest in, whether it's the common stock or they will have an opportunity to invest in bonds or convertibles or something at some point in these companies. So I just thought it was interesting in that you could look at the um, press release and stuff. People should do that and get an idea. But this will be common probably for a bunch of cruise lines, airlines, things like that. So, you know, and uh, yeah, it's just that those might be some of the bigger opportunities, honestly. Uh, the bonds or the, or the equity? Uh, I didn't read enough about the bonds yet, but uh, yeah, the bonds could be pretty interesting. I mean, the equity could be pretty interesting, but uh, you know my feelings about this. I mean, the equity of the cruise lines, I don't think is very likely to be worth much unless they, well, there's, it could be worth something if there's a way of reorganizing things. I mean, It has happened in the past, to be honest. There have been cases where a company has filed for bankruptcy knowing that its equity would have value, but it still needed to file. That has happened a few times. Now, it happens usually more due to like litigation or something like that, some weird things like that. Like they know they have to make a very big payout, but if they can spread things out with getting new money in, I've seen a case where actually the company went through bankruptcy and didn't even have any cash injected into it. But I don't know how these things will work out, but there are cases with things like the cruise lines where it's possible their assets are really good. It's just that this is such a long time to recover from this. So, I mean, we even say things where I say 2020, 2021 for the coronavirus and stuff. Uh, Everyone keeps saying 12 to 18 months for a vaccine to be widely distributed. Um, There are two pandemics in the world. One is the HIV pandemic and one is coronavirus. The HIV pandemic, they would have hoped to have had a vaccine 30 to 35 years ago. They still don't. So you might have a vaccine. You might not have a vaccine. We don't know. Um, you, if, unless a lot of people get infected, you won't have a lot of immunity. S- people have died on cruise ships. Um, it's known to be a way that these things spread. So I don't know that you'll have a very fast recovery. And if you load things up with debt and stuff, I don't know. So I just think there does have to be some sort of restructuring no matter what, for these companies, because I don't see how even if they survive, they can in any way grow and stuff like that. And there's some other industries where I think the same thing, but I do think there has to be some sort of recapitalization of the cruise lines, which could be done by government stuff help, or it could be done a different way. Um, I mean, what is your thought on the government, you know, helping them with this? Because people say they don't necessarily pay U.S. taxes. So why would they be helped by the U.S. government? Hmm. Yeah, I can see that point. And the government might try to ask them to um, pay taxes in the U.S. and stuff. A lot of companies pay very low taxes and avoid taxes and stuff. Um, I don't know the answer to what they'll do in any of these cases. Uh, Same thing with, you know, airlines where they tell them if you you can't buy back stock or or whatever. Um, We'll see what happens with any of them. I don't know. Um, the point of bailing them out isn't to get taxes from them, though. The point of bailing them out is to preserve jobs and things like that, especially in other parts of the economy. Um, I don't know. If, I think it would, be a, it would be a harder sell to bail out cruise lines. I don't know that – I also don't know that cruise lines are as in need of a bailout as airlines. Um, I think they have to be recapitalized. Uh, airlines are a little more complicated. Uh, I think they're in a tougher position than cruise lines. Cruise lines longer term have a problem that they might not be able to get back their traffic, but I think airlines are more desperately in need 
because yeah. they they don't have the balance sheets that they need to have and because they're very inflexible in terms of being able to cut workers. In fact, they've agreed to things by taking money and stuff not to cut workers, even though they'll have to later. So I don't know. I just think there has to be some sort of recapitalization of these companies, some sort of restructuring, whether it's done in an actual bankruptcy or not. So I think that whether you own the equity or you own the bonds, the convertible bonds or whatever, it's going to be some sort of thing where stuff is exchanged for it or something's done about it. That would be my guess. I don't see another way out of it um, for these companies. Yeah. Interesting. Out of all the stocks that we went over, or will we still have to actually go over Straco? I'm sorry. Straco Corp. This is a company that's in China. And you had wanted to uh, talk about it um, because you said that they closed their park again, their their aquarium. Yeah. So their biggest asset is the Shanghai Ocean Aquarium in Shanghai. And this is the concern that I have with all these companies when we talk about this. Um, this company has closed. So this is in China. And if you listen to news reports and stuff, people will say China is over the virus and stuff like that. Well, they closed an aquarium again in Shanghai. This is the third time that they've announced that they've been closed. Um, they didn't give details about it and why they're closing everything. They just say the uh, coronavirus situation in the city, meaning the city of Shanghai. Uh, the stock has not dropped nearly as much as you would expect from all that. Um, but oh, you should also mention it's a Singapore company. It just operates assets in China. It also operates the Singapore Flyer, but um, it's not really a Chinese company. Uh, the It just gets to the concerns that I've mentioned about these businesses and stuff in terms of theoretically, there's not much of a virus at all in China right now, but the business interruption is still happening. So that, that's still at a level economically that's worse than you'd normally have. Like if this was happening, say what they're doing here by close down aquarium, if that happens at other times in the US and different states where there isn't much of a virus, if you're still closing down theme parks and things, it's something to keep in mind because it means that they won't make money and they will have problems. Um, so it's just a thing to notice that although people say there isn't much virus in Shanghai or anything, they're closing their uh, businesses. They're closing an, you know, an attraction, at least an aquarium. So. Mm -hmm. That would mean that's concern for anything that owns theme parks and sports venues and things that show uh, all sorts of different stuff around the world that what that reaction is. It's just, you know, um, that's why I talk about with all these different stocks about the concerns that we have. When we talk about things like Canterbury Park and Game Host and all those and Carnival, um, I just we need to be realistic about how long they're likely to be shut down and having no money coming in. And you can see that with Straco, where they've been shut down. Their biggest um, property has been shut down several times. The latest, just uh, not only not that many days ago. Um, even though, in theory, that that's a place that's one of the least affected on Earth, supposedly right now. Um, and it is. Do you think people in. are too optimistic when they're handicapping, uh, handicapping the odds of like everything just going back to normal, and the markets being back to you know all time highs and everything like that? Do you think they're too optimistic when it comes to how this is actually going to affect businesses, you know, going forward. Yeah, I, I do think that. And that's why I'm more pessimistic on those things. I shouldn't say these things because all I get is a lot of emails about it, asking about why I feel that way. Oh, but, really? Yeah. That's all I get since we had the last talk or two about it. Uh, but I, I guess I could explain what I meant last time we talked about this. So you talked about coronavirus and stuff. And I said like, whether these things were sustainable. So at this moment, we're basically we're about two weeks, a little more than two weeks from the time that the U.S. federally announced um, a stop the spread uh, plan. Right. So their federal guidelines have been in place for two weeks. If you look at what people in the U.S. public health officials are talking about, the models that they're talking about uh, for predicting the numbers of deaths and things like that, the ones that they always point to, those models assume social distancing of the kind that we have now. Um, through the end of May, not through the end of April, through the end of May. So we are right now then two weeks into a 10-week shutdown, right, federally. So that's 20%. We have 80% to go. Um, that's a long time. And my concern more is in things like um, just some of the numbers. So like, let's say New York. So as of the time we're recording this, I've heard that New York has 1,500 deaths. Now, if we assume the death rate is really 0.75%, so somewhere between 0.5 and 1, the official rate is 
in New York. Uh, it's been 4% or 3 to 4% in China at times. It's been even higher in some other countries. But those are unlikely to be the real death rates. You're just not counting enough cases if you're getting death rates that high. So let's say the real death rate is 0.75. If that's true, 1,500 people dead, that means that at the time, so of significant lag, let's say it's a 10-day lag from when you get infected to when you're likely to die. I don't know if it's 10 days, but we'll use that. Then you're about 10 days behind when you had maybe, let's say, 200,000 people infected in New York State. That's not the official case number, but if you take 1,500 divided by 0.75%, you get 200,000. So even if I take that number and double it a few times to when they expect to have the, um, the peak in, let's say, around Easter, um, so about two weeks from now, even if I do that, I still get a total percentage of the population for the entire state and probably even for the city of New York that isn't that high. It's okay, maybe 10% of your population is affected, maybe 20%. That's not that great in terms of a total amount of immunity that you have uh, in the population. And we don't know how long immunity to this lasts. So that's not great for being able to actually open back up and have people come in from other places. Like I mentioned, uh, Straco is a Singapore company, right? It's in China, but it's a Singapore company. Uh, well, Singapore, can it deal with coronavirus? It's a very small place and it has a very strong um, party that's able to get compliance from the local population. So yes, it can, but can it open itself back up? If it doesn't have immunity in the population and it doesn't have a vaccine, how does it do that? And so what I've always worried about in all these places is, uh, rolling shutdowns. So it's, I don't even know about shutting down for 10 weeks, um, which is what these models assume now. But we're assuming, or I feel like the market's assuming, that the shutdown will be 10 weeks or less, maybe. Um, it will happen once. I don't know that if, given how governments have responded this time, that you won't see shutdowns of quite a long time for at least parts of the economy um, again in this fall again next spring, again next fall. I don't know. I don't know if it'll happen two, three, four times in a matter of a couple of years, but I can see things where it's possible in certain industries and certain economies and things where you're shut down for on average 20 weeks out of the year for the next couple of years. So either the public response has to change in some ways in some places, or you're actually planning to shut your economy down for you know 40% or whatever of the time. I don't know how you do that. And the bigger concern that I have in terms of like the recovery and stuff we're talking about is um, given the unemployment rates they're talking about and stuff, the assumption that you'd hire everyone back doesn't make sense to me. So like if you're a, um, let's say you're a CEO or whatever, one of these companies, CFO, CEO, of these companies that ran into problems, you thought you were doing everything right. And now you just have been brought to the brink where you needed government assistance to survive, right? Um, there was an article about Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines, to my knowledge, I could be wrong. It's been profitable for about 40 straight years. It had maybe a 18 months, two years, something at its very founding where it didn't make money. But after that's been profitable every year, it hasn't had any mass layoffs that I know of, and it's not had any mass pay cuts that I know of. Um, it will take government assistance and all that stuff, and it will probably still not be able to say we don't have to lay people off and, and um that we don't have to cut wages and stuff when we come back, right? They're not guaranteeing that they won't have to do that. So I just think that if you ask someone at a place like that, whether it's hotels, restaurants, airlines, theme parks, cruise lines, whatever, retail, that they may say like publicly, oh, when we get money from the government and all this stuff and everything that we're going to, of course, we're going to want to get back on track expanding and doing all the things that we were planning originally. But I would suspect if you talk to them off the record, you're more likely to get an answer that the way they're thinking about running the company is I want to run the company in a way that this will never happen again. And if companies decide to do that, that means holding more cash. It means being more careful about how many people you hire. It means doing all sorts of things to be ready for a bad situation, which is why I mentioned things like depressions, because that mindset is what causes depressions in certain industries and stuff it's a very sharp swing in confidence. So the risk-taking behavior, the animal spirit swings very dramatically. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there's devastation to the overall economy. In 1980s in Dallas, 
right? There was depression in the real estate market, in the commercial real estate market, and in some oil stuff and things that was absolutely a depression. But it doesn't show up at all if you look in terms of like employment figures and things. Now it wiped out almost all the banks. Uh, but if you weren't in banking or in commercial real estate or in oil, you probably wouldn't have noticed. Um, the average person working in retail and stuff wouldn't have noticed. You didn't have deflation in the area. You didn't have high, really high unemployment. That was completely unusual, anything like that. So all sorts of different things can happen with this. But even if you, if you look at what the unemployment rates expected to be by some people where it peaks, if those companies that are hiring people back decide we'll only hire back 80% of what our workforce was before, um, that leaves you with a significant amount of unemployment, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't see why they would hire back 100% because I don't see why their appetite for taking risk would be as great as it was before this happened, especially because, and it depends on their, how they view the virus, but I don't see it as possible that a government could promise they won't do this again, shut things down again. So if sure. you know that it could be shut down again in the next year or two, you're in a worse financial position than you were before. And remember, there'll be less demand initially. So there won't be an immediate need to hire people back. You're hiring them back on speculation that demand will return. So when you factor all that in, it's just hard to see why you would get a complete recovery. Um, not, that you, not, not that it won't be incredibly sharp recovery, because if it's an incredibly sharp drop, it'll be an incredibly sharp recovery. But the question is whether that V that you're talking about um, gets back to the same level, the other side of the V, as the, the first half that you had. And so I would expect that you'd be significantly below that. Um, so I, I just think it'll be doubtful. About it'll be that. interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting as well. I mean, to your point about, you know, employers and companies hiring back 100% of their workforce. I'm also curious to see if the general, I guess you could say the norm is going to change as well. For example, like with, you know, people kind of making it work using Zoom and Slack and DocuSign and all these companies and kind of running your business from, you know, people's apartments and houses and whatever, I wonder if people are going to think different about their operating leverage and having all these expenses, you know, for like office space and insurance and all that sort of stuff. Do you think that will change at all? Yeah, I don't know how that will change over time because one thing we don't know is anything about the productivity of people working at home. Um, you know, I was talking to someone who works at a college that went to online. They're having incredibly high rates of people just dropping out even though they've already paid. Because, and that's a known thing. It's not unusual because people don't stick with online programs anywhere near as much as they do in person. Um, there are reasons why uh, different companies have their office workers in a centralized location to monitor them. And without certain tools and stuff, they'll see a big decline in productivity for some people. For some, they won't. But, you know, yeah, um, you're going you're gonna to have interesting things happen with looking at their productivity as compared to what they'd be like in an office situation. And there'll be ways that they'll try to analyze that and see what that means, um, whether more people could work from home and all that stuff. But, I, but just things like that, I don't know if it'll be a long-term change. There's a lot of people talking about like, will that change forever? I don't know, but will it change for the next couple of years? As long as there's still concerns about spreading a virus in some part, you know, as long as it's still in the news, and as long as there's the potential for it to come back at times in waves, um, then I would think that there's it's just hard to see a complete recovery in certain things. Like I don't see how there'd be a complete recovery in air travel. Air travel is down 90% by traffic and also down a lot in price. So presumably that means revenues are down 95% or more. Um, you know, to put that sharpness in perspective, I believe in the great depression, home building dropped 80% from top to bottom. So this is a bigger decline in something that's still open theoretically than, uh, than you would normally have in the deepest depression. There'll be things to bring them back from that, but it just takes a while to get back from those things. And I just would think that you'd be very um, experiencing a lower level. I don't think you need airlines to be as big as they were before this happened. Now, a few years down the road, they'll, they won't, there won't be enough capacity, right? But for 2020 and 2021, are we going to be at a point where any of the airlines need to be the size that they were before this started? For restaurants, like when I look at things that like New York City or anywhere here, you know, I live all around restaurants and stuff. It's assumed that like the unemployment caused by restaurant closures will come back. 
But I just think the large number of the restaurants, not a large number, but let's say, do I think that 10% won't reopen? That sounds right. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, it's hard for me to believe that, that 100% of them can survive a shutdown of this length. I mean, some of them were in great position before. Some of them weren't, you know? Um, so I just mean, if you lose 10% of your restaurants in an area or something, you can't have the other 90% of the restaurants make up for that um, employment change. You know, they can't make up for it. So there'll be some business extinction too. So I just factoring those things in like, okay, well, what if 10% of the businesses in certain areas go out of business, um, you know, in industries like, like restaurants and stuff. And then what if the 90% that survives say, well, can I make do with 80% of my former workforce for now? Um, when you add those things up, that's a significant amount of unemployment and stuff. So I'm not concerned about like the short term stuff really at all. I'm not concerned about what happens. Like, can people pay their bills and stuff when they get these payments from the government and all that for now? I'm concerned about what, like what the effects are longer term of having done a shutdown of this length and having the risk that it might happen again. It's not just like getting through this thing. That's not the thing that concerns me. So when I said things about the sustainability of it, what I meant is the sustainability of it economically. Like if you do this for, let's say, theoretically 10 weeks, if you do it and then look at your economy afterwards and you're seriously concerned about it, will you risk doing it again if the virus affects your country in the same way at a later point? You know, will you do it again in 2021 if you are still feeling the effects of having done that shutdown and now knowing what it does? Mm-hmm. So, but, it, but if you have a big V-shaped recovery and stuff, then maybe people will be very comfortable with it. I just feel like to me, what I'm looking at is people are very aware of what the virus does and the cost of it. They're not very aware of the economic cost necessarily. And we'll see what happens with that. But it's hard to believe that um, you can recover as quickly uh, to where you were before. And of course, I'm saying this also by the way, meaning if you spend all this money and stuff, so in addition, of course, there's no doubt that businesses and um, governments will have a lot more debt, too. So that's uh-huh. not even taking into account the fact of, you know, those increases and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, but I, I don't know what the situation will be. But in general, I'm much more concerned about all these businesses that they'll be below, that they'll be earning less in the future than they uh, were before this happened, I, you know, for a couple of years, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, most of the businesses we talked about, I don't see examples of businesses where I would think that they'd be back to the levels of earnings that they had previous to the start of this year within the next, you know, two years. Wow. That's interesting. Very interesting. Very scary too, I guess, right? Hmm. I mean, you just, our job is to go and find stocks that look attractive. And many times the best opportunities to buy are in recessions and things like that. Um, so you know, 2009 was a good opportunity to buy. Uh, the 1930s were one of the best opportunities to buy ever. So, you know, I think that, and especially in these industries that are very distressed, those will be the best opportunities to buy, you know. Um, it's just a, you know. So, and, yeah. you know, when you, you, I mean, you said earlier that you, you're, you may be pessimistic. I will say and go on the record that Jeff has said it could be an opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah. you know, to, to buy companies. So for pe- if you think that, you know, he's pessimistic or whatever, I mean, you definitely obviously are, are approaching it with that mindset. Um, let's go over the Focus Compound daily. If you sign up on our website, focuscompound.com, enter in your email for free uh, every day, Monday through Friday after the market close, you will receive the Focus Compound daily. And what that is, is a question that somebody had emailed into Jeff. Jeff will answer it. And then we uh, send it out to everybody if we think it's you know worthy of everybody else's time. Of course, at the bottom of this email, you could ask Jeff a question yourself. You just click ask Jeff a question. Uh, and today's question was from somebody who said, how can you use a stock's EBIT margin to find the right EV to sales margin to buy that stock? He's like asking, like, um, you know, at what price can you buy it at? Uh, almost like when you put valuation on uh, companies by doing it like that. Mm-hmm. And he says, what's the math behind the link between EV to sales and operating margin where you want a 50% operating margin if you are to pay five times sales on an EV basis? And your answer was you can use a stock's long-term 
average EBIT margin and today's sales to estimate a normalized PE ratio for the stock. And then you went into the math, which I don't know if you want to go into the math itself. Do you want to go into the logic of yeah. it? This is just it a good one for people to check out the math. You could go to my Twitter at Focus Compound and I tweeted this out. Yeah, maybe if you go quick FS, we can just show an example with the company. So if you just put in just put in Cheesecake Factory, for example. All right. So obviously they're affected now this year, so it's totally different. But you look, what's the long term? Even margin seven point four percent was the median, right? Yeah. So at a price to sales or EV to sales of zero point, um, where are we there? Of zero point seven four on that, you would be at a price where you're at about ten times normal pre tax. Uh, profits. So you could buy the stock at 10 times pre-tax profits. And then given where tax rates are in the US now, that might get you a P of 13 or less. It would be less. So um, that's an attractive way to buy into the stock. So anytime that you see that the uh, the EBIT number is a percentage that is higher than the EV to sales number that you have, then that becomes attractive. So if that even number was say 10%, then you'd want to look at a chance to buy the stock at one times EV to sales, right? And now you have it much lower, obviously, because they're having problems and stuff. But you can tell from that that obviously they're a lot cheaper. So probably Cheesecake Factory trades at what, that's 1650 or something like that, it's saying. So if that's the case, then at 33 or something, it would be at um, more of a, or even more than that, it would be at more of a level that's in line with 10 times pre tax earnings normally. So it's trading at, you know, closer to like five times pre tax earnings or something. That's obviously because of the situation right now, but it tells you the stock is very cheap. So as a general rule, I'd say 10 times pre tax earnings is um, on the cheaper side of fair value. So anytime you can get a stock below that, it, you're getting a good deal. And the reason for doing that is just to adjust for the cyclical nature of um, EBIT margins, because often the best time to buy a stock is when the um, EBIT margin is low. And I think EV to sales generally is a better way of buying stocks than PE ratio. Yeah, and it's just a shorthand way as well of doing it. A lot of times when Jeff, you know, just quickly wants to eyeball something, he'll do that math in his head and it just kind of tells him where he's at relative to the stock. Mm-hmm. So it's just a shorthand way of doing it. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself in today's podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up. And of course, a rating and review goes a very long way for Jeff and myself. If you found us through Twitter, make sure you hit that follow at Focus Compound. And you can definitely get the Focus Compounding daily either on my Twitter or join the email list at focuscompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much and we will 